Okay, well, hello, hello. I am Laura Chestikoff from Firebird Summit. Welcome to this week's episode of Grow or Die. And hey, pal, how are you? Hey, Laura. This is Lawrence Henderson from Business Operational Support Services, LLC, Long Form Boss. <laughs> and we're going to go with short form today. <laughs> so, okay. So, you know, we were just catching up quickly, but mm -hmm. uh, to set this stage for anybody who, you know, watches or listens to this uh, some other point in time, it is June 3rd, 2020. We have had a very very tumultuous uh, week in the United States. Um, we are coming off of a week of protests around the country um, in response to the, the um, murder of George Floyd. Um, most of those protests have been peaceful. Um, there have been a few that have turned into riots and there have been some definite, definite examples of uh, exactly what's being protested, which is some pretty extreme uh, police brutality just out of the gate. Um, and so it's, it's kind of been all over the map. I think there's been an interesting set of responses. And, you know, last week, obviously, you know, Lawrence and I talked a lot about, you know, a lot of this stuff and it was, it was a tough kind of place to start. So before we start, um, I want to kind of circle up and ask Lawrence, kind of what his take on the last week has been before I pick our topic, because I have a topic that's kind of related to that, but also brings us back to some coaching stuff. So how you yeah. doing? Today? Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, and thank you for just that simple question of how are you doing? Right? I think this last week, if there was ever a call for a heartful check-in, it's been this last week and that's where I'll leave that. Okay. It's been checking in. It's been important. Okay. Well, you know, you were making, you were making a point about yeah. how this is kind of a really um, good opportunity for those yeah. who've been trained as coaches to really apply what we've been trained. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of inclination to react to things in mm. ways that um, don't always include the, curiosity or the holding space, yeah. or the, the listening to other people's kind of agenda and perspective that, you know, is at the heart of what coaching is, is uh, trying to instill in those of us who take it on as a profession. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's a really important point. And, and related to that, there is another aspect of what we are trained to do as coaches that I really want to talk about today. And so um, back up just a little bit um, is that you know, one of the things that I have continued to really be noticing this last week is that um, one of our one of our biggest, I think, social ills that's kind of led us to this point in time um, also functions at a personal level, and that is that when when people are not or when people assume that they will not be held accountable for their behavior, it can sometimes, and especially over time, and especially once it's institutionalized, it can make it very hard to um, keep them behaving in a way that is consistent with the um, trust that is placed within them. Um, I think we see this at the moment, obviously, obviously at the heart of it, I think that's what police brutality is, is people who have um, a little bit too much confidence that they will not be held accountable for their actions. Um, and it makes it very easy to abuse that. I think, you know, the old saying, absolute power corrupts is exactly what we see in this situation. Um, and I think it's, it's part of what we're seeing at a federal level with how the occupant of the White House is kind of reacting to things, wanting to, you know, take a strong man Richard Nixon-esque approach for, you know, coming out swinging with people who are trying to have peaceful protests. But I think at the end of the day, something that I've been thinking a lot about the last few days is that, you know, there's so many, there's so many difficulties when it comes to, you know, being accountable or holding people accountable at, a, at that macro level, right, in the societal context. And I think one of the things that, that is maybe very useful for us as coaches is to remember that accountability starts 
with us. And it starts with habits that we form and ways in which we think about how we relate to other people. And so I kind of want to take this macro scary mm -hmm. issue and bring it down to a micro personal level, yeah. right? What does it mean to be accountable and or to hold others? Yeah. Yeah, you 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 started to tap on it, right? In in this work, what I also see as that accountable work, you need to own how you're showing up. And that takes doing the self being self-aware, but then also the self-management because to tell somebody how to feel and what we're living through in today's society is again what we say as coaches, you that passing that judgment and, and all the rest of that, which that's the part of it that we need to, to show until we and, and put ourselves in a position to seek to understand why the response is the way that it is. And once we seek to understand, again, you talk about personally, taking that personal approach, taking that on as a personal accountability when showing up for people. Um, and, and this is across the board. You don't have to be professionally trained as a coach and certified as coach. Just be human in conversation. Be respectful. What are your values? Which values are you leading through and living through in this moment? And, and are you taking a defensive posture or a curious posture? And to you bring that up earlier, I think that's really what the heart of it is personally. Are you taking a defensive posture or are you curious of how we can move this forward in a positive way, in a healthy way that gives us the ability once we are operating in full-blown authentic love and care and appreciation and value for each other then we can start having the not i don't see color colorblind conversation but the color bravery conversation because this is a reconciliation that needs to happen and continue to happen and a conversation that can needs to grow in its capacity but how do we extend that to others we need manage the expectation. I always say you train people how to treat you. And in this moment, you, you brought up the systemic issue of somebody who can brutally overstep boundaries of humanity due to what their position or they believe their position allows them to do. That's like me as a former army officer, me and my soldiers, I know how we were trained for combat. And for us to come back home, go to our armory and say, you know what, because we know how we have this training, because we're full-blown American heroes, we're going to patrol the streets of our neighborhoods because we've been trained and we're in the uniform and we're good to go. Like By carrying AK-47. By, yeah, by carrying Air like M4s, M16s, because we're trained and you, you owe us that homage, right? We're, we're gonna police up our streets just like we do the rest of the world, right? It's a, that you would say, you are crazy, Lawrence, for thinking that y'all could do that. Well, well, where is that same level of outrage towards people who have a slogan, protect and serve? And they're supposed to be a part of our communities. And, and to Laura's point, like, if you aren't just being human and watching what's happening, like I'm really questioning people at this point. Like I'm really calling people out. And you you brought up, you know, your appreciation for organizations that you support stepping up and look, we know there's no perfect message in this season, but by God, just have a human response to what's happening and show your people you have a heartbeat and blood is coursing through your veins and saying how this is making you feel because people are longing for a leader in organizations that give them permission to feel like a person. Like, yes, they do a job for you, but by God, if humanity was ever going to want to corral itself around each other, it's going to corral itself around leaders who show them it's okay to be human and be soft and be squishy and have emotion and all of that stuff. And so I'm, I'm thankful for the leaders in my life in organizations I'm a part of that didn't wait for the perfect press release, but they were thoughtful in the way that they messaged. They were intentional about the words that they used, but they were more than anything empathetic advocates of the moment. 
and said, I will stand with you. We will determine what action looks like from our organization's perspective, and we will move in a very intentional way. So what I like about that example is, is that it's, it's an example of people choosing to hold <clears throat> themselves accountable, right? One of, and it's, again, like, as I've been thinking about it this week, for me, that's, you know, there, there are two sides of this coin, right? There is the, I will hold myself accountable. And then there is, okay, I'm going to maintain my boundaries. And that means I'm going to hold somebody else accountable for when they violate those boundaries. And, you know, um, I have like these two totally hysterical kind of pop culture examples that I always think of on these two. So when it comes to holding my own boundaries and, and or sorry, holding myself accountable, um, there's, there's this sort of like minor plot point in the Lord of the Rings that I think a lot of people overlook where both Gandalf and Galandria refuse to touch the ring. They refuse to take the ring from Frodo because they understand self-awareness that they don't trust themselves with that kind of power, that they are afraid of losing control. And even if they're trying to do good or do something well, that that much power is dangerous. And they understand enough about themselves that they do not want to put themselves in a position to violate who they want to be by allowing themselves to be tempted into the abyss. And I love that example um, because it really is, there are places where we have to make choices about this. You know, you, you alluded to the organizations, right? There's, there's a client that I work with and have for, you know, quite a while. They're a publicly traded company. And yesterday an email went out from the president that started off with, opened up with Black Lives Matter. And there is an important racial conversation that needs to happen in this country. And, you know, we're supporting our employees, listed all the things they're doing to support employees, including everything from, helping, um, you know, pay for the hourly wages of frontline employees in cities whose locations have had to close because of riots, um, paying them anyway, uh, to starting con um, unconscious bias training, to starting a webinar series to bring people together and have conversations. The first webinar was last night. And, you know, after a week of just wanting to cry every time I, you know, read the news or looked at something online, it was it did make me cry, but out of like real genuine, like gratitude, like the, the webinar opened up with the CEO of a publicly traded company, practically in tears talking about how like, this is unacceptable. And we're just at a point where this is just not okay. And that as an organization, they don't feel that they have, um, the, the luxury of staying quiet. Um, and that they are, they pulled in, they pulled in four speakers who are from all over the country all over different employees of different levels. Two of them were people, or sorry, three of them were people of color. And one of them was a white woman with a black husband. And all of them were talking about consistent, you know, stories and experiences of, you know, how do I, how do I protect my six-year-old child from seeing this video? Because like, I, I don't like, that's not, it's not an okay. First of all, I mean, it's like a horrible thing for anybody to have to watch. But if you have a, if you have a six-year-old child of color, who's hearing about this, who's like, how do you, how do you have that conversation with a child that young? I mean, it's hard enough as they get older, but like at that age. And so it was a, it was a really amazing conversation. You know, then we're, then they were talking about other examples of, you know, these, these professionals who drive home from work at night and, you know, get tailed by the cops or who have, you know, police officers show up at the, pull them over and then a police officer show up at their, at their car window with the gun already drawn, not even waiting, you know, um, one, one of the gentlemen has a white wife and was talking about how he was coming home from his in-laws house one night. And, you know, the cop showed up at the passenger side where his wife was sitting with his gun drawn, saw his white wife and put his gun away. And he kept thinking, what if I'd been by myself? Like, you know, and it was, and part of what was really fantastic was they were creating a space to have these conversations and people were asking each other questions and they were, it was like, it was a very, it was the example that we would want to see of high integrity leadership, you know, and it was, yes, there are tangible things they're doing. They talked about the money they're donating to, to racial justice organizations and, and they're talking about the community stuff they're doing, changing in some of the, their public messaging and marketing and things like that. 
but simply creating this space and recognizing that they're holding themselves accountable. One of the things that was really, that I especially loved was the CEO came out and said, look, we do a really good job out in the field and in our locations of, of hiring very, with a lot of diversity, promoting within those locations. What we have not always done a good job of is that next level and into the corporate level. So my commitment to you and what I am holding myself accountable for to you is that we are going to make a more concerted effort on that. And that is going to be a priority for us for the next year. And so again, that's like one of those like, you know, moments where you can hold yourself accountable and you can make the case for why you have come to recognize that you haven't necessarily been great at it in the past. And you are now looking at it with a different perspective and recognize that you have something to do. Yeah. I think, I think what, what people need to truly, truly embrace now in this season is it, we always used to use these quotes as, as these rallying cries for development, but failing forward, right? Like, we have enough trips and falls along this road of, of social injustice, of having hum, humane conversations around policing, over-policing, or the you know, excessive use of force and all these different conversations. And I think now, uh, my hometown, uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, just read a LinkedIn article today that they have, the city has written in racism as a public health crisis in the city of Columbus and are moving towards listing police brutality over policing all of that as a public health crisis to lead towards social justice reform. And again, what are you doing as it pertains to being accountable? Because I think a lot of times, well, I'm going to do my part. Okay. What does your part look like? What does that lead to and again some of the things i'm doing from an accountability standpoint is i'm not allowing people to silence me and that includes me and my gremlins of how i have processed the trauma in my life from being a black man in america being a veteran i I, a husband a son a brother in this in having my stories of that same trauma and being quiet about it. You know, at sophomore year at college at a church convention, Alora, me, my brother, some cousins, some friends in three piece, we look like a pack of Skittles for a church convention. And we are literally getting profiled and got stopped by the cops about did we shoplift from a store when we a bunch of young men getting some gum because we go into the teen and youth service because we <laughs> at a church convention. We literally look like a pack of Skittles. And you're following us. And it was in it. I didn't, I didn't even know. And crazy part, I had just got back that from basic training. I just got back from basic training that summer. And I, I was pumped about this church convention. And I'm like, are we really being followed by the cops in three piece suits? Yeah. Like, but it was, what are y'all doing? we're going to the same place all the rest of the, you see these people in church clothes going to this convention center across the street. Like that's where we were. We were across the street from the convention center in church clothes. Like people, people get dressed up to go rob stuff. I, that's a new one. Right. But, but that's simple. But again, just the mental state of something like that, just to have those example after example and I was talking to a um, young, young mentee of mine yesterday, uh, 20, young 20-something, 20 and from an affluent area, uh, North, North Atlanta, and how he was brought up. And for lack of a better term, he was kind of guarded and sheltered from a lot of what would have happened to him if he grew up in South Atlanta. Two, two polar different worlds here. And this is locally. And him never being allowed to feel and always having to turn on lemons and eliminate lemons and eliminate and i just and i i just asked i said how are you and he was like and he and he was pausing and i'm like dude how are you and allura just for him to sit and say helpless yeah and it's just like there it is. 
We, we could do work now. Now that you put a name on it, now that you know where it's coming from, let's do work. And, and to your original point around coaches, like we coaches were built for this moment. Coaches were built to be able not to ask powerful or hard questions, but necessary questions for the people who we're holding space for. And when we talk about accountability and ownership, there's one thing I always love saying. What's, what's the one thing you're willing to do? And then begin to stretch on that thing. Because if we don't know what the first step is, why are we even looking at the 20th? You got to take, we got to take a step. You can't, you can't skip to the end, right? You can't. Not with this. Not with this work. To be fair, not with anything. Like, I mean, yeah. I think this time, and, I'm, and in a lot of ways, I've been lamenting our, our goldfish attention span, you know, unwillingness to put in time, instant gratification culture. Because honestly, I think that's a big part of what has, has made some of this so much harder to deal with, right? You know, I hear, um, actually, it was funny because I was thinking I was listening, I was listening to Pod Save American. Actually, I was listening to your mayor. Keisha Lance Bottoms, who's just an amazing badass, and she's been phenomenal in how she's been responding to the protests and and dealing with police brutality in in Atlanta. You guys had you guys had a situation where, you know, six cops have been fired because they yanked kids out of their car when they were just stuck in traffic because of the protests. Um, anyway, but but part of what what you know was really um, was really great about what she was talking about was that. Um, you know, not just the, the accountability, but that, that, that realization that, you know, she had to change the steps she was going through, right? One of the things she talked about um, in the interview was um, that in the past, before, you know, even last week, she probably wouldn't have sat down herself and watched all of the body cam videos of the police officers who had pulled those kids out of the car. Um, and because she said she would have, you know, she would have seen on the news, she would have watched it, but she would have kind of just trusted that the process was working a little bit more instead, because obviously with what's going on, she wanted to be more aware of it. She said she spent about five hours sitting and watching and rewatching the body cams of these like seven officers between five and seven times each, just watching the videos and watching the videos and processing it. And then she walked out and she fired them. Like that was it, it was not. And, and part of what, you know, she was also talking about is like, she's a mother of four. Like she's, you know, talking about how, how is she supposed to, again, it's back to how do you have this conversation with your kids and neither you or I have kids, which in a moment like this, I'm kind of makes me super grateful because I like, it's such a heinous conversation to even contemplate trying to have like when I was, you know, I, I like, it's, uh, yeah, like it's just, it's just such a horrible, it's such a horrible thing to try to figure out how do you have a conversation with kids. But I think what I liked about what, you know, what Mayor Bottoms was talking about was that, you know, there are a lot of steps that can be taken, but we also have to like, stop, like come back, regroup, look at it again. And then yes, come back to an accountability structure and, and what, what is it that we are going to hold ourselves accountable to? But then that brings us to the other side of this equation, right? Which is how do you hold other people accountable, right? And this I think is super, super entwined with boundaries. It's super entwined with a yeah, lot yeah. of stuff. There is a very big difference on a personal level, like, you know, like spouses versus, you know, once you start dealing with institutionalized power. So part of what I, I actually, again, what I keep kind of seeing when I look around is that there are so many, you know, again, one of the things that I got on that interview was, well, you know, voting doesn't matter. You know, I don't see it helping. And it's like, well, if that's, that's, that's the mechanism for accountability in a democracy. Now, there's plenty of arguments to be made about the fact that our democracy is suffering a lot of damage and, and is in serious jeopardy for a lot of reasons. But, yeah. but fundamentally voting is the accountability mechanism that we have most available to us within the context of a democracy. So if we take that down to a personal level, you know, again, another pop culture story. And I love this one because this one is, um, um, I think really telling. So, uh, on an episode of early, on an early episode of red table talk, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith was talking about how, um, when she and Will first started dating, uh, they were they were out one night at friends and it was 
like the first time they got into a fight. And uh, it was very early in their relationship and she started cussing and calling him names and whatever. And he like yanked her in the other room and said to her, I will not be in a relationship where we talk to each other like this. If you are not willing to find another way to express your anger, then we're done right now. And when she tells this story, it's really phenomenal because she talks about how she was gobsmacked that he did that. Like she had been coming from a series of relationships and places where that's just how you got into an argument with somebody. You, you cuss at him, you call him names, you scream and yell, you throw, you like, you, and like, and the fact that he was so clear about his boundary and that he made it very clear that he was going to hold her accountable to that going forward and gave her a choice. And this is, this is the choice. I will not allow myself to be pulled into this. And part of what, and, and, you know, and it's, and it was great because she talked about the things they've done over time to kind of work through their communications. But what I love about that example is I think so many people struggle with how they hold the people in their lives accountable. And if we take out of the equation, extra complexities like addiction and stuff like that, where it's very like trying to hold somebody who's got an addiction problem accountable is a whole different kettle of fish. But like the people in our lives, you know, there's so, how many people do we have in our lives who really shouldn't be in our lives and we're not holding them accountable to their behavior. We've either compromised our own boundaries so many times that they, they just think it's okay to steamroll us, or we've given voice to our boundaries and then we've just not held anybody accountable to respecting them. And I think this is something that if we can't figure out how to do this at a personal level, it becomes really, really hard to expect people to do this at a macro level. So I want to talk about it at a personal level. How, how do you start to hold the people in your life accountable? Forget coaching for anything else, just like friends, family, yep. people whose behavior you witness or who, who you, you know, or treat you in a way that's not okay or whatever, mm -hmm. violate your boundaries. How, where do you start? And having yeah. conversations about holding them accountable and, and exercising that discipline. Yeah, I think everything you just said is, is a part of where you start, right? But you have to identify what's, where's your line as it pertains to how people communicate with you, how people come into your space. Um, I know, and again, the, the, the youthful example that I could give is, Growing up as a young preacher's kid, um, everybody knowing my father was a preacher, we were in, in church, and kids would cuss around me. And they would immediately, my bad, my bad, my bad, man, my bad. I, I, I know you, I know your daddy a preacher. And instead of using that example to protect my space, I would say, oh, nah, man, I'm good. And so what started happening is they began to get more comfortable and more comfortable cussing in my presence. Well, so much so that one day mom pops up at school to come see me. And one of them uses an explicitive towards me, not as a derogatory, but as a, some sort of acknowledge, playful acknowledgement. In my mom's face, the horror and not that they said it, but they said it to me. And I didn't flinch. And so I say that to say, I said to, kind of this way before, we train people how to treat us. Either what we address or not, you're still training people how to treat you. And, and I think you need to get really clear on where your lines are as it pertains to, and I love that Will Smith story because him understanding what his boundary was around protecting his energy, protecting his heart, protecting his peace. Um, well, and it was also about examples for his son. Because his, his, son, his yeah. son's first marriage was too well, adult. And was there actually when, when that yeah. happened. And that well, was actually, I forgot. And that that's also that. too, right? And those are the observations, right? Because who's watching that? The second, third, and fourth order effects of an, uh, of an action like that, right? The person doing it may not, be cognizant and aware of the second, third, and fourth order effects, but how we respond to the behavior. Now, how it made us feel, but addressing the behavior, I think that's how, where we start is when you acknowledge things. And my wife has done it to me over the course of our marriage, 16 years, where 
she would acknowledge, you're not going to talk to me like one of your soldiers. I am not your soldier. I'm your wife. You talk to me with love. You talk to me with care and, or we'd be in public. And she'd be like, stop it. Stop talking to me as if you're giving me a direction. She said, people will believe you're allowed to do that all the time. And she, and she's like, it's the craziest grin I ever seen. Like I'm afraid of her grin. Like, I know I was like, I'm about to get flicked or something, but, but again, well, it's the acknowledgement. It, well, and it's not just that people will think that yeah. you're all the time. It's that people start thinking that it's okay for them to do that. And 100%. Especially, especially as a woman of color. Like, yeah. I get talked to in ways already yeah. that are yeah. totally unacceptable. For sure. Take entitlement as it is. So for sure. that she definitely doesn't need, you know, you inadvertently yeah. piling it on. Yeah. Because of my, because to your point, if somebody sees me do it to her, and then they have, and, and again, why would I say they have the goal to do it to her? Like you just told them how to treat her. You just gave them an example of how to engage with her. And so I think people being mindful when they're with pe- with their audience and again, catching themselves. And I think that's where we start, right? Again, I go back to the heart work and the head work and the conscious ways that we're walking and living on a everyday basis. This is a marathon. In, in getting this to become a habit for ourselves. Um, because again, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. And so if you've been practicing the wrong way for so long, then again, there's gonna be some recoding that you have to do and you gotta begin chipping away at this thing. Um, it's not gonna happen in a day. You just gotta keep practicing what right looks like. And again, having people in your circle, strong people that you allow, that you give them permission to call you out when they see behavior that is damaging and disparaging and checking your ego to say, you know what, you're right. And I've, man, the host of people I've given permission to, to check me, I love them to death. You know, I love, I love that saying you just, you just use practice doesn't make perfect. It makes permanent. And I think that's really, um, that's really important to remember. I also think it reminds me of, of actually what you were, something you mentioned a week or two ago, which was when we were talking about how, um, how to deal with um, people who, re- who are having like a reaction to stop and ask, right? Don't just blow through it. Don't just, you know, continue on through. And I think this comes back to, you know, using your voice. This comes back to not, you know, giving yourself permission to speak. It also comes back to holding, you know, people accountable. You know, in that example that we were talking about, if I say something that, you know, you have a reaction to, I have two choices. I can either try to move on or we can stop and address it. Um, you know, sometimes the person who's having the reaction isn't necessarily going to be the one who's aware enough in the moment to stop, in which case then it's back to, all right, so to your point, am I teaching them that I am just going to ignore them when they get emotional? Am I teaching them that, you know, they can be volatile and maybe disruptive or maybe disrespectful in that process or just, you know, completely withdrawn and that I am not going to acknowledge it like that's probably not helpful and now admittedly you don't you know you got to pick your battles because you're not going to get into every little nuance of detail with every little person that you ever come into contact with but you know to your point that some people matter more than others in your daily life and you know if they you know choose to behave in a way that you're not okay with you have to decide if you're going to stop and raise the issue or just try to blow past it and, you know, hope like hell that it just doesn't come up again. Cause yeah. hope ain't a strategy, man. <laughs> At all. Hope is not a strategy. It's never a strategy. Uh, and I, I like to say, even as it pertains to try, oh, how do we instill good behavior is the other part of not assuming people that we engage on a daily basis have been shown another way, right? And go if we go back to the practice makes permanent comment I made, when we talk about the rioting and you address, that's, that's the result of something that's been practiced over, you know, that, that ends up a action in their life. And I'd say, particularly to the youth, right? 
that parents, if you're listening, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, if you're listening, grab those youth and really seek to understand because my wife as an educator teaches in a disparaged population. They don't have access to resources, to mentors. They're in a part of Atlanta where they got, and everybody shows up to give them programs, but it's not consistent with where they have to go home and what they live with and what they are exposed to on a daily basis. So if really, if that comment is really true, practice makes permanent, what are they allowed to practice more often than having to be good in a classroom? That's why crime goes up in these areas in the summertime is because practice makes permanent. Like they're practicing what their world looks like. And so they're easily pushed in a direction that seems familiar, chaos. And so until we're in positions and we're actively in the game as players to show them there's another way, it's all about access and then giving resource and equity to be consistent and disciplined in the way that we engage our communities. And I think that's also too is what's really going to come up in this is, are we really going to put money where our mouth is as it pertains to teaching and giving people access to a better way of processing um, the way that we feel? Because again, that young man I described, I know for a fact, he could have easily been somebody who was torching a building, breaking a window, um, stealing something because it was opportune situation, but he wasn't exposed to that. So he knew there was another way to process this and he stayed home. But how many of them, I processed chaos my whole entire life. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go be chaos, yeah. right? Well, so. I mean, so again, I, this is, that's actually part of what I really like about yeah. You know, Jada Pinkett talking about yeah. that time Will stopped her because like she didn't she didn't actually know another way to have an argument with somebody that you supposedly love like she and from her perspective at that point in her life and this is why telling her telling yeah. the story now is super super powerful because she recognizes how how flawed that was and that she was set she was really kind of you know on a one way on a one way road that wasn't going to go anywhere good. And that it, it really was a pivotal moment, not just for their relationship, but for her personally to actually recognize that, no, there's actually a very different way that you can approach this. That's not as inherently destructive to the people around you as well as ultimately to yourself. And it's so, you know, and that's where, and of course, this is where social justice gets fundamentally difficult, right? Because it's a two-pronged set of, pro well, three, really. You've got, you've got the model behavior, you've got, you know, economics as a weapon, and then you have, you know, institutionalized brutality and racism that, that go unchecked because nobody's accountable. And so you can't, you can't solve the problem by only, you know, hitting one of those levers. It's got to be, you've got to work through all of them. And it's, which is why it's, I get why, you know, the young woman in that, in that interview was saying that, you know, voting doesn't feel like it matters. I, I, I get why it feels that way because it's, it's a big, big issue that has not gotten any better, certainly not in her, you know, fairly young lifetime. Like it's not, it's just, she's watching it worse, not better. So I get why that feels that way. But on the other hand, you can't expect results when you don't put in the effort, right? You're not going to go try to run a marathon tomorrow if you've never trained. Like it's not, and, and to your point, all of this is a marathon, like all of it, pick, pick one. I, I mean, marathon's like the best metaphor I can think of for all of this stuff right now. And, and you got to start somewhere. Yeah. I think, I think you, you, you bring up a fundamental way to approach all of this is there needs to rise to the occasion leaders in every one of those lanes. It's like a track, right? Stay in your lane. But where you feel led to get in the game or get in the race, stay in that lane. Because, but then it's it's almost like the, the pacer, right? Of a marathon. There's the pacer and he keeps the group together, right? To give, give them a good pace. And what's been happening is it's been more like NASCAR 
right? You got the pace car, but then as soon as the pace car is out the way, everybody just get boom, right? And every, and not think. I, lo- and, I like the, I like the NASCAR uh, and, reference and the, only because there's also a great redneck factory. Right? <laughs> it's great, 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 right? And I, I I slipped that in, but um, but in in that the pack and the race they stay together. But what we see in the world is the NASCAR race where everybody's jockeying, trying to get forward, and who's going to be the lead car. And where we need a race in a, a folks that know, I know what I'm good at in this race. I'm going to stay in that lane, but I need a group of people that are going to back me in that lane. And, but we need to pace with each other. We don't need any part of the program to outpace the other right now, when it comes to process and what needs to go first, when it becomes signature time or whatever, because of the way our democracy is built, then, then let that be the thing then. But I think getting to the line, we all need to be there at the line. And then again, all right, you're next. You're next. You're next. So it's not taking, all right, this lane, it takes you three years to get there. All right, that next lane, it takes six years to get there. And next thing, it takes 20 years to get there. No, we need to fight, we figure out where our leaders are and who's going to pick up the mantle in each of our lanes. And then we need to run as a group. We need to pace ourselves right? We don't need to outpace ourselves and have more energy over here than energy over here. And again, it's going to take us all to get really strategic about where we fit as players in this game, right? Just don't try to look for a game to play in. Look for a game that aligns with your values, what you want to see in the world and how, how you could show up fully. Get involved in that movement to support this thing because everybody, every, everybody is necessary in this in this race i think that's a great a great point and i think it's really um you know back to our our you know it's it, we're coming up on five o'clock there are plenty of you know protests around the country already you know the ones that the violence definitely decreased last night overall um so hopefully that trend will continue but it's usually you know after it gets dark that things start um and so on the east coast here we're you know coming into that time zone now and, you know, one more evening of watching the news and seeing how things, you know, play out, seeing which cities stay peaceful um, and which cities, you know, don't look so good is I think, you know, a very, there's, it's like this deer in the headlights kind of exercise to some extent. And I think it, it makes it hard to feel like there is something that we can do. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, keeping in mind that there are different ways to approach this is, is probably really, really helpful, right? You know, again, it could be that, you know, your focus is on stopping, you know, police unions from negotiating with cities to prevent cops from having any kind of oversight. You know, or it could be that your preference is, you know, working with kids who maybe do come from homes where they're not seeing, you know, behavior that's going to be conducive to their longevity modeled at home and they don't have to see examples someplace else. Or it could be, it could be any number of ways to tackle the economic crime. It doesn't, I don't know that it matters what it is as long as it's something that you feel like you have some staying power on. Because again, we're back to it, it is a marathon. It, there's nothing about this that's going to be solved quickly, um, but I think the other the other aspect of it is that you know one of the values, and this is I think a general um, benefit to social justice movements of any of any flavor, is that once you start getting involved and you start meeting other people who are passionate about what you care about and who are trying to make a difference in that arena, it's sometimes the sort of sanity saver that we need to stick with it on days when you just wake up in the morning and look at the news and just want to cry and go back to bed. Community. That's what we all need. It is. And, and I think, I think that's the other thing that's really interesting to me about right now, right? Is I, there's been so much um, disproportionate pain inflicted, economic, dis, disproportionate economic pain well, and, and health pain too. Yeah. Right? Um, inflicted on on communities of color, on inner cities, on you know places yeah. that have have been um, easily labeled as the kinds of uh, places where police brutality is the most 
commonly seen. Although interestingly, one of the statistics I was I was reading this week is that over the past few years, urban police brutality has actually been on the decrease since 2014, but it's been increased so much in rural communities that it's actually offset any gains in in the inner city areas, which is a whole other a whole yeah. other conversation. But but to be fair, it's still you know it's still one of those things that I think watching. Sometimes does make you feel helpless. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot of places that, that you can help, but you got to find something that you care about because this For is sure. solved soon. And you really need that gas in the tank that comes from finding other people and building some community around that. And especially after, you know, sheltering at home or being isolated for yeah. 10 to 12 weeks or however long some of us have been and, you know, feeling disconnected from the world. I think it's, it's really telling that, you know, this is where we, where we land. Yeah. All right. Let's, ready to, ready any, to dig in. Any last thoughts today, pal? Yeah. Just, um, just around, you know, really decide if you're going to be a player or a fan. Okay. Well, I guess my last thought is, some people are not willing to hold themselves accountable. And if your boundaries are important to you, then you have to make sure that you're prepared to hold them accountable. And uh, at a personal level, that can mean one thing. At a systemic level, yeah, I know, our democracy is very broken. But guess what? Voting is how you do that. And while I'm on a voting plug, people like to focus on presidential elections. But the kinds of things that we're talking about being most directly impactful here is local stuff. It's yep. district attorney, it's police commissioner, it's yep. mayor, it's local stuff that happens more often than not on off presidential leaders. So if you only mm -hmm. ever show up to vote when there's a you know presidential election, you're probably missing some amazingly important opportunities to help secure your community. Yep. So yeah. all right, that's that's my PSA on the on the vote. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate Stay you. And I appreciate you too. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.